Okay, so welcome everybody to the third panel. Again, if folks can sit down so that we will start. Chit chatters in the back of the room, that means you. <laughs> Okay, so again, I want to thank everybody involved in this. I want to thank my co-organizers, uh, Arielle Azoulay and Bonnie Honig and Gabrielle for the amazing exhibit and Kogit for uh, sponsoring this and all the amazing technical assistance that we are getting from the people at Kogit, Kit and Trout, as well as the technical assistance from MCM, Arturo. So thank all of you, and thanks to everybody in the audience for sort of, you know, staying, staying through and being such excellent discussants. Um, so in this panel, I will introduce uh, the people all at once, again, as we've been doing in the order of the, of the presentations. So first we will hear from Bashara Dumani, who is the Joukowsky Family Professor in Modern Middle East History and the Director of Middle Eastern Studies. He's the author of the book Rediscovering Palestine, Merchants and Peasants in Jabal Nablus from 1700 to 1900, and the editor of Family History in the Middle East, Household, Property, and Gender, and Academic Freedom after September 11th. Uh, he's also a public intellectual who writes on current events in the Middle East, on the ethics of knowledge production, and on the relationship between culture and politics. Then after that, we'll hear from Alessandro Petty, who's the initiator of the educational program Campus in Camps in the, I'm sorry in advance for mispronouncing this probably, De Haisha Refugee Camp in Bethlehem, Palestine. And he's co-director of the Architectural Studio and Art Residency Program, Decolonizing Architecture Art Residency. Um, that's a program that combines research and spatial intervention. Uh, the projects from that decolonizing architecture projects have been shown in various museums and biennials around the world. Um, and he is also co-editor with Sandy Halal and with A.L. Weitzman of Architecture After Revolution. Then we'll hear from Vizira Zamindar, who's Associate Professor of History here at Brown and co-director of the South Asian Studies Program. Um, she works at the intersection of anthropology and history with an interest in cross-border histories for thinking about a divided South Asia as well as looking at the politics of violence and its impact on history writing itself. She's the author of The Long Partition and the Making of Modern South Asia, Refugees, Boundaries, Histories. And she's presently working on a second book on the history of archaeology and war on the northwest frontier of British, British Indra, India sorry, at the borders of Afghanistan. Next in the fabulous panel, we have Mia Charlene White, who's Assistant Professor of Urban Studies in the Department of Black Studies at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She's an urban so sociologist who studies the racial, economic, and gendered consequences of neoliberal regimes of spatial discipline. So she looks at things like redlining, gentrification, displacement, et cetera. And she also considers the, po the possibilities of activist or bottom-up challenges to those processes. Uh, prior to joining us in academia, Mia spent a decade working in social justice philanthropy at a number of places, the Ford Foundation, the Robin Hood Foundation, the Ms. Foundation for Women, uh, where she worked on such things as promoting women of color in public policy, uh, equitable uh, redevelopment after Katrina, environmental justice, immigrant rights, and post 9-11 redevelopment. And then uh, finally, we will have Paul Fagelfeld, who is the academic coordinator of the Digital Cultures Research Lab at the Center for Digital Cultures in Leuphana University, Lüneburg. He, studied, uh, cult he studies cultural studies and computer science, or he studied those at Humboldt University in Berlin. Uh, he also worked closely with uh, Friedrich uh, Kittler and is one of the editors of Kittler's Collected Works. He's currently actually completing a dissertation 
entitled The Great Loop Forward, Media and Mathematics Between China and the West. Um, other subjects of his expertise and specialization include cryptology, open data, artificial intelligence, and robotics. And he also works as a curator, a critic, and a teacher uh, at the Art Institute Basel and the University of Arts in Berlin. Uh, and perhaps most relevant to our discussion today, he also coordinates the Refugee Phrasebook project that I'm sure we'll hear more about. Um, so again, join me in welcoming all the speakers for this session. Hello, everyone, and thank you for inviting me. Um, I'm, the prompt was for media uh, objects and for uh, basically media studies and political theory. I'm a historian, so I may be a little off key here. I apologize in advance. Um, so I prepared a brief presentation on the erasure of refugees and the refugees here in camps in Jordan, which I visited this past January along with a group of people from Brown University. Uh, somewhere in this virtual wireless world, actually the word I had was wireless, uh, they exist, or, or so it seems, because they're very hard to see and very difficult to actually physically meet. Uh, and specifically, I had three sets of images. One was uh, speed dating with NGOs. Let me see, how does this work? Like this? So if you, this is one of the Zatia refugee camp. Uh, one of the enclosed areas uh, within the camp is this long corridor, it's like a shopping mall really, of all the NGOs you can imagine in the world who are working there. And of course, the last thing you'll ever see in this NGO shopping mall is uh, our refugees. They're just not there. And anytime you want access to anything dealing with refugees, you have to go through these offices and they find all sorts of ways why they can answer all your questions without ever having to meet uh, a refugee. And it was quite difficult, actually, uh, to go through that filter. I'm speaking fast because I decided to change my talk while I was sitting listening to all the papers. <laughs> and um, I, the entire seven to 10 minutes was about this. But in fact, I want to reserve most of it to some reflections on what I've heard so far. Um, so there is a formidable barrier in the humanitarian field. Now, lots of them are really great people, but many others um, are part of an NGO machine, really, um, uh, that is part of a governance structure that is much of the problem as it is of the solution. Another set of pictures had to do with, and these are all pictures I took, um, <clears throat> uh, the, what kind of a prison is uh, a refugee camp? In this particular case, uh, it doesn't look like much of a prison. It's a vast open space. Um, but in fact, um, there are so many matrices of control, uh, of which the only obvious ones are the big ditch around the camp. There's wi barbed wire. There are security forces and gates and so on. But these are not the real places where control comes in. Uh, refugees can get out and they can stand on a hill and they can just stare out into space. Uh, but they realize that there are so many other barriers between them and normalization of life that they just cannot overcome very easily. Um, and I'm going to stop there on that one. And then this is the one that interests me the most. It's the what I'm calling the WhatsApp refugee. That's because uh, refugees may be not in place where they used to be, they are in a different place, but in fact, uh, they spend most of their time uh, in communication uh, with places elsewhere. Uh, there's kind of a real collapse of space and time uh, using literally WhatsApp and other apps on their cellular phones to be in constantly in touch with, and in fact, real social actors in distant places uh, because for a variety of reasons, uh, there's a lot of movement uh, from Jordan to Syria back and forth, of fighters, uh, family members, and um, goods, and other things. And this is all coordinated through this wireless network. The problem is that uh, 
the authorities know this as well, and they make sure they don't have good reception in certain places. So this is right outside the security fence of one of the Jordanian military installations in the camp, which, of course, the wireless network doesn't shut down at all. They figured out ways of hacking it, and they just need to get close enough to it to be able to pick up the signal. And so they, uh, this is not good, great pictures because they're in a car zooming by, but uh, you can just see how uh, they are, um, in a way, trying to tap into the military wireless network in order to communicate, uh, and this is a big part of their life. Now, the difficulty of seeing and the difficulty of meeting refugees um, uh, are things that these pictures may impart in one way, uh, but uh, there are other ways, I think, that we can discuss the question of erasure. As a historian, I keenly feel the inadequacy of the terms refugee and the term crisis. Um, uh, or more accurately, I, need, I feel the need to put them in a larger context of displacement, a word that hasn't been used yet, which I think is absolutely fundamental. Um, because I do see displacement uh, as the primary engine in the formation of the modern world. Uh, and I think we need to go back historically to the 15th century with the discovery of the New World when a, a third of the population on this planet was destroyed within a short period of time uh, because they lived there. And uh, into this vacuum uh, rushed in various uh, tsunami-sized waves, uh, the slave trade, uh, the great migrations from Europe, uh, and so on and so forth over the next two or three or four centuries that really transformed the world. Uh, and not just in terms of movement of people, but also of plants and microbes uh, that changed our cultural regimes and displaced untold millions of people, uh, and so on. Uh, we can take one look at this, and that, would, of course, would be the slave ship as a way of thinking about displacement uh, during this period. Uh, and to show that those running away from civil war or war or some sort of a conflict are but a drop in the ocean of the actual displacement that takes place in the world. So we're talking about a very tiny, minute part of world history right now. Uh, and it cannot be understood apart from this larger process of displacement, for example, infrastructural projects such as the building of dams, or cap changing capitalist sort of relations such as beginning of industrial agriculture. For example, this has something to do with industrial agriculture in the United States, and that is uh, Mexican workers trying to sneak into the United States, uh, packed in much the same way as in the slave ships itself. And this is not so different from, of course, the typical pictures of the refugees. Um, this packing of bodies goes on for all sorts of reasons, of which this crisis in Europe is, uh, of course, a small part. So in what sense is this a crisis, really? And how are these displaced uh, represented as refugees? Uh, in many ways, it's only a crisis because brown and Muslim people are knocking on the doors of white and Christian people. And so it is a crisis in Europe. And this knocking represents a challenge to the European political moral order and Europe has to think about how it can deal with the situation. Now, this is not a new story for a historian. Something exactly the same happened 100 years ago, or 150 years ago, if you want to push it. That is to say, the questions of how to deal with populations that are either, well, let me push back a little bit. Just substitute the word question for the word crisis. And what do you have? You have the Jewish question, you have the Eastern question, and many, many other questions of the 19th century. And these questions had to do primarily with two things, which should sound familiar to this audience. One is how to deal with populations that are either already a people, not human beings, a people, or have potential peoplehood. Okay. How do you deal with such people, with such groups, um, especially if it means a challenge to the uh, political order of Europe? And the second question that these questions 
wanted to address is how to manage the collapse of a political order that is in, in a neighboring area. In this case, the Ottoman Empire, the weak man of Europe. There was this idea that this Ottoman Empire was about to collapse, and preventing its collapse was the basic principle of British foreign policy for almost 100 years against the Russians and others, and the question of what would happen to Europe if there is a collapse of this political order right on the borders of Europe, how would that change? In fact, would it plunge Europe into a world war, which is, of course, it did. This is the same exact situation because we're talking about a collapse of a state system that was established in the, United, in, in the Middle East by European colonial powers right after World War I. Syria didn't exist, Iraq didn't exist, Lebanon didn't exist before World War I. Some of them are collapsing right on the edges of Europe. And so the question has become a crisis. All right, so this is deja vu, of course, for a historian. Um, and it's deja vu twice over because the response then, as it is now, is a kind of questioning of the discursive formation um, that Europe assumed that it existed in. That is to say, the focus of analysis is the destabilizing impact of the other on a kind of a positivist image of what Europe is all about. And uh, the second deja vu, in a sense, is that the historical structures of power to help produce these conditions in the first place are too conveniently forgotten. Uh, in fact, uh, European modernity is in many ways a active engine of erasure. So let's take for a quick example what was happening also in, uh, in the Ottoman Empire in the late 19th century that is very similar to today uh, that still has no name. Uh, 11 million Muslims ethnically cleansed from the Caucasus and, and from Eastern Europe, from the Balkans, because they are Muslims, towards the Ottoman Empire, causing all sorts of other ways of displacement within the empire itself. Uh, they were not turned refugees. Um, and then you had, that is a form of ethnic cleansing, of course, is something that becomes very familiar to 20th century history. But another form that comes familiar to 20th century history is genocide, the Armenian genocide, especially in 1915, uh, also happened in the Ottoman Empire around that period of time, and they were not thought of as in the same terms that they're thought of today. Uh, and the third, which is a kind of a government-controlled, orderly population transfer, like what happened in many other parts of the world later in the 20th century, was done between Turkey and Greece uh, in the early 1920s. Uh, these population transfers, this genocide, this ethnic cleansing are all forms which Europe then would arrogate to itself as, ah, now that it's happening in Europe after World War I or World War II, then we can think about it in certain terms, and then we have to understand the rest of the world in these terms. So there is a kind of an erasure of a human experience and a ways of talking about that human experience that has not really been absorbed yet in these discussions. So refugees yes, and crises, yes, have a lot to tell us about um, a kind of a, a European um, generated epistemological order about the human, the juridical human especially, about sovereignty, about humanitarian law, and they have a lot to, to tell us about these things and I think that's very important. And yes, as someone who comes from a refugee family, uh, this iconic figure of the 20th century deserves the greatest attention, including critical analysis of how this figure is discursively reproduced and politically instrumentalized, and the political spaces this kind of a critical perspective or approach can open up for future change. That is absolutely true. But instrumentalization in reverse, like Orientalism in reverse, can only take us so far. It may well be impossible, of course, to find an analytical apparatus and a vocabulary that is not self-referential in the sense that it always engages a specific positivist epistemology that operates through erasure. It may be also impossible to render normal, that is to say, 
displacement as historical and global phenomena that is happening all the time, to render that normality as exceptional in the sense of creating these categories of refugee and crisis as defined again by European experience after especially the Second World War. Uh, I don't know how we can do it. Um, I'll leave that as an open question, uh, just like the prompt. Uh, how can we think about the refugee crisis in broader terms? Um, how can we think of displacement as a process, uh, not an event? And how can we find a way to um, deal with the incredibly unusually large number of forms it takes and the hugely diverse groups of people it involves? And the kinds of my minute temporalities in this process that really need our attention. And here, I would like to just end by talking about the bouncing ball effect. That is to say, uh, if you look at the studies of the Palestinian refugees, for example, there is a lot about the fall, 1948, of this ball from somewhere. There's this crisis and this ball falls. And there's a lot about the refugees settled somewhere in some camp and what is happening to them. But there's no real accounting of this bouncing of this ball, how it got from here to there. What kinds of choices did people make as they went between 1948, basically until 1952, 1954, and most refugee camps became settled and permanent, of one place to the other, to the other, to the other, why and how and what happened to them and what did they do and how did that transform them? And we have the same issues now in that sense that there's a crisis in Syria and there's people knocking on the gates of Europe. But what is happening in between as people bounce from one place to the other as they come up with strategies? Uh, now it's much easier to study this question actually because of social media is allowing these people to constantly be in touch with people everywhere else about what they're doing and what they're doing now, what they're doing the next minute and taking photographs and so on and so forth and that in many ways could be the way that we can find a, some solution to the question of how to look at this in a broader context. Thank you. Maybe I guess I will start um, exactly from where uh, Bishar ended. Uh, Trying to make a history between these two pictures. This is the Hesha in uh, 1952, and this is the Hesha today. Um, um, because I think what is in between these two uh, historical moments, um, I think it's especially the work that we are trying to, um, to develop, especially in the last few years, trying somehow to account um, a gap that exists um, between a specific event, which is the Nakba in 1948, and the actual status of, um, of the refugee camp. Um, and this space and time between 1948 and today, um, in a way, has always been um, negated. Um, in one way, from both main uh, national narrative, you know, the Israelis. Um, um, of course, um, you know, referring also to only to the contemporary situation, um, but also in the main narration of um, of Palestinians, the camp, especially in relation to to return, um, will simply disappear. Now, um, here I would like maybe, um, of course, in a bit provocative way, to try maybe to mobilize three keywords that are important when we try to understand what happens in refugee camps from 1948 um, until today. So the first one is to mobilize history. So what does it mean uh, to make a history of a refugee camp, which is in fact constantly um, thought as without history. In fact, you know, that has to do very much on how we look at images, and, and both spaces and people, in fact, they never have history. You know, their history is constantly somehow negated. So the first move is somehow trying to uh, 
to dig into these images and to find um, a space and time that actually is, uh, is negated. The second thing is also to undo that relation between um, the importance and the history of refugee camps and the right of return. Because as we know politically, the right of return has um, marginalized the importance and the meanings of a life in exile. So I guess all the work, I mean, what we try to do in, what we are trying to do in the last years is exactly trying to um, understand what uh, from 1948 until today um, has happened and in a way what kind of meaning, uh, what kind of uh, stories are embedded uh, in, this, uh, in this space. And of course the third important aspect is the notion of normalization. Um, because whenever you mobilize this concept, whenever you actually start to um, think about the history of refugee camps, the first accusation is uh, normalization. It means that um, by simply thinking that direction would imply and means that you are uh, negating the right of return. But when we um, somehow start to uh, look at these images, this is the, I think you should have, right, the 1952 images with the tent. This is how still today we uh, somehow conceptualize um, refugee camps. Are, we are still you know, very much understanding them as a temporary spaces. Um, but we also know that in reality, they actually became very much more complex spaces. Um, and of course, in that regard, refugee camps, um, being the oldest refugee camps, I think have a specific um, and important space in understanding the history of these spaces. But these are, I guess, uh, also important in thinking that most of the camps that are proliferating you know, in, in these uh, last years, unfortunately, this will last for many years to come. I mean, I think most of us might also have um, a kind of same um, hope and ethical position to start saying that camps should not exist in the first place. But however, I think Adi you know, brought that also before, these spaces exist. And that kind of space, I think that uh, in a way, we should try to, uh, to understand and try to understand what are the possibility uh, to operate in such a, a complicated um, and um, compromise space. Uh, in fact, it's definitely a not, uh, we are not put in an ideal position when we start to think about that, but maybe um, understanding the historical passages, for example, how from this structure the Haitia was transformed into that. I think it's a lot of stories of these passages. Um, this is an image in 1968 in which there was an important passages when uh, shelters were uh, built in which people had in a way or another start to negotiate a space of existence and dignity. And that regard, architecture, of course, has uh, always played a very crucial role in um, tending to normalize. So whatever you start to build a wall or a roof, uh, it would, of course, imply that you are negating the right of return. I mean, why you should you know, have a proper house that uh, you soon will go back home. Um, but at the same time, I think all that, uh, these uh, important passages, in a way, um, specifically for the case of Palestinian refugee camps, um, create a space in which uh, somehow the, the possibility of, uh, of, of uh, living that life in exile with all its contradiction um, ultimately would not imply um, forgetting about the right of return. So in that sense, I think there is a lot of things that we can learn from understanding um, every single years or decades in which the camp itself was transformed uh, from being place uh, made of very fragile stu structures like tent, tent to, to have shelters and then to became more and more uh, you know, spaces in which you have an urbanity that, for example, exists beyond the notion of public and private properties. Uh, and this, of course, for people that are interested in, um, um, in understanding how 
social and, 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 uh, and can, can, how social structure can be organized, I think it's absolutely an interesting space to, um, to start to look at. Um, and then you have, I think I would like just to show you, I'm not sure what kind of image do you see now? Okay, now I know. Um, so this is a photo montage that bring together these two uh, different time. Um, the site of the image where you see the tent, this is the Haitian 1952. And what is in front is Doha, which is somehow an extension of the camp itself. And the story of Doha is also um, an interesting story that uh, in a way uh, is not fully acknowledged. Doha is a refugee city and is actually an independent municipality that is run completely by refugees. And, um, and this is also something that, again, it uh, says something about the different possibilities when we, um, um, when we live in a situation which somehow, in this case, I think both words, refugees and crisis, they are both linked to this idea of permanent temporality. Um, I think they both have this condition which, in fact, we are, they are extended into time. And we, how many times you know, we talk about crisis as if something that should evolve and, and then get normalized, but we know that this is continuous time. And the same is, of course, the, um, uh, the world of, of, uh, of refugees. So the issue is, at that point, how, what kind of possibility exists in, um, in trying to engage uh, this very compromised space, um, uh, but also trying to um, uh, somehow to recognize what uh, uh, refugee themselves have built in, uh, into this here. Here I will not have the time maybe to talk about different uh, projects that try somehow to account to, uh, to that kind of history. Um, among them, more recently, we are working um, with the popular committees of certain uh, refugee camps in, the, um, in producing uh, documentation evidence for description of refugee camps as World Heritage Sites. And also this done with uh, the idea of um, challenging um, what does it mean heritage uh, and um, who decides also on certain values and what are in this case also the uh, the meaning and, and there are uh, the meaningful objects and immaterial structures that are a part of refugee camps today. Um, maybe the other part of the work is also for us, um, and then I finish you know, very quickly, it was also how we um, as architects could actually intervene in that space in which beside maybe a, a more analytical understanding of a situation and research, we'd also be able to um, produce maybe uh, visions and, and objects um, around which discussion actually could, uh, could take place. Um, this is one of the recent projects that we, um, uh, we did, uh, that in a way try maybe uh, implicitly to collapse the two images that I showed to you at the beginning. This image of 1948 and what is a camp today, collapsing them in one single structure which is, uh, look like a tent, but is a tent that is solidified um, as a concrete house. So in a way, try to inhabit this sort of uh, contradiction and try maybe to recognize um, that besides um, all the difficulties, a culture of exile um, uh, has been produced since 1940 until today, and, and proposing that that sort of uh, specific point of view maybe could also be a, a place um, to which we can also understand the possibility of return. I'll stop here. Thank you very much for um, inviting me. And I'm going to explain the context of what I'm going to talk about maybe in the Q&A afterwards in view of time and just go ahead uh, with uh, my presentation. A friend of mine posted uh, this photograph on his Facebook page in September 2015 with the words, this is also happening. It made me stop scrolling and it made me ask, the question, uh, it made me ask this question, what did he want us to see in this image? 
a densely packed crowd of people on a street stretching as far back as I could see, caught between the ruins of war, heads bowed in eerie, quiet dignity. The men and women in the photograph are not pushing or shoving despite the density. One man in glasses is clutching a piece of paper. What is happening? This image was circulating widely on social media and newspapers at this time. When I Googled the image on September 15, uh, 2015, I got 60 hits from someone twittering a hashtag support refugees, using this image to the integrated refugee and immigrant services, using this image to fundraise uh, uh, for uh, their work. Please give refugees the gift of safety, freedom, and hope by making a tax deductible, a deductible gift to IRIS. Um, newspapers uh, were using this image, and it was being published alongside a maelstrom of articles and editorials on the Syrian refugees coming to Europe. Um, I can give you uh, many examples, but I'm going to skip through them. And um, the, the coverage, uh, in summary, whether they were arguing for more humanitarian support for Syrian refugees, making the sea and border crossings, or whether they were, the articles were expressing worry about too many refugees coming to Europe. This photograph seemed to be mobilized to represent the generic refugees in plural and a pitch of a crisis. Photographs bear witness in ways words cannot, yet how we give meaning to an image can depend on the words that surround it. So what is this relationship between photographic images and words moving as it was at lightning speed, uh, shaping our understanding of displacement at this time? Now, the original photograph had been taken on January 31st, 2014, in the Yarmouk refugee camp on the outskirts of Damascus, a Palestinian refugee camp that came into existence after the Nagba of 1948, an old refugee settlement for one of the oldest refugee communities in the world. When Assad's forces began attacking it at the start of the Syrian war, most of the 160,000 Palestinians fled the camp, and this photograph was taken as the last remaining 18,000 or so residents waited in desperation for food aid distribution. Unarva circulated this photograph to alert us to the urgency of the situation in the camp that winter of 2013-14. And its website includes audio and video testimonials of the utterly dire conditions of hunger and deprivation in Yarmouk. Here's one testimonial by Faraz. Many of us wish to die, but we cannot end our lives. We can do nothing but wait, like in the play, waiting for Godot. We are waiting for someone who never shows up. Now, this historical specificity necessarily changes how we see the photograph. It becomes a photograph of more than half a century of displacement, the long durée of both crisis and abandonment. It is both a photograph of both desperately hungry people and of extraordinary endurance. It is a photograph of people who may not have survived as we see it today. It is a photograph of determined survival. At least since the studio crafted photographs of uh, Madras famine in the 19th century, we have been trained to see hunger through emaciated skeletal bodies. Such photographs of hungry people in remote places, as a historian James Wan pointed out, help transform Malthusian attitudes to hunger into humanitarian virtue. Even though famines continue to occur in colonial India, and even as we understand the political nature of famines and hunger. This photograph is clearly not that kind of image of visible deprivation of emaciation, albeit the death wish, in the words of Faraz, gives this image a certain kind of gravity. Even though it is not that kind of image, it still raises the question, how did this photograph of hungry people waiting for food delivery come to be circulated as a generic image for the Syrian refugee crisis. 
When you take the words Yarmouk, Palestinian, and hunger away from the image and leave only the words refugees and crisis beside it, the image does change. A densely packed crowd of people on a street stretching as far back as the eye could see, caught between the ruins of war, heads bowed in eerie quiet dignity. There's a sheer density of people that fills the frame of the photograph, and the density of people stretching as far back as the eye can see becomes a swarm. A swarm of people escaping war, a seemingly endless swarm of people escaping war. Now there are many ways of thinking about fear and numbers. There is a fear of small numbers, minorities, terrorists, the fear of large numbers, mobs, mig immigrants. To induce fear of large numbers, imprecision is as important as repeated calculations to give shape and weight to a crisis. Precise numbers cannot function alone, cannot establish crisis. This photograph provides that imprecision to numbers, swarms, vague numbers of people in the image, blur the exact numbers in the words and charts that accompany it in all the newspaper reportage. The photograph becomes the context to give meaning to the words and not just the other way around. If this is happening, it is not just that refugees escaping war are coming to Europe and that there is a refugee crisis. It is also that there has been a long ongoing refugee crisis elsewhere, elsewhere. And although we can look up numbers for refugees in Lebanon, Turkey, Pakistan, Iran, Kenya, which completely dwarf those of Europe, there are no photographs trending to bear witness. And as you can see in this, this is a 2010 infographics from UNHCR showing that the largest, everything in orange are places receiving refugees, in purple producing refugees. Um, and Pakistan is one of the largest uh, uh, home to refugee populations, Syria included at this time. If we have been unable to grasp refugees or crisis elsewhere, give an urgent or anxious account of hospitality, poverty, or strife in other geographical contexts, then there is another image. This is a photograph of a group of young men wading to safety to the shores, of course. The man in focus in the center appears to be carrying his world in plastic bags, shoes in hand, his exhaustion and relief palpable, eyes closed in quiet prayer. He has survived a crossing that many have not. However, when the photograph appeared in newspaper coverage with the words Pakistani, as it did when it appeared in New York Times with the story of the Pakistani government's refusal to accept 30 deportees sent by Frontex on December 3rd last year. 90,000 Pakistanis were deported from the EU in 2014 alone. This image is drained of courage or prayer and it instead becomes an image which is training us, preparing us to separate refugees from migrants, those who are fleeing war and require a humanitarian response from us, and those who are merely seeking a better job and must be deterred. It's one of the ways in which the fear of the swarm becomes a way to disaggregate, separate, segmentize um, uh, peoples. This same photograph also appeared in a BBC article. The BBC has been consistent in framing this is happening as a migrant crisis by arguing that all moving people should be considered migrants until their asylum application has been accepted and only after which they can be recognized as refugees, something that came up earlier today as well. However, this image appeared on BBC entirely without the word Pakistani. Um, in a piece entitled Migrant Crisis, What is the UK Doing to Help? which surveyed British efforts to help Syrian refugees despite UK's rejection of uh, EU quotas. So are these young men Pakistani or are they Syrian? 
I really do not know this, but uh, this national determination clearly has enormous consequences for how we see this image, how we are supposed to see this image. One of the problems is how do we understand what the image is actually depicting? This undertaking of an extremely risky journey without the context of war, without the explanation of war. So the narrative goes, the only reason why people are taking the journey to Europe at the risk of their lives, putting their lives in their hands in this manner, is because there is nothing left for them back home. The home is in ruins. If life is self is future-oriented aspiration, in this sense, they have no choice really but to seek life elsewhere. But if you put the word Pakistani in, then such an undertaking, such an enormous risk, ceases to make sense. Why are these young men making this journey? The stats tell you that Pakistanis are amongst the top 10 seeking asylum seekers in Europe presently. So the word, of course, must appear sometimes along the many photographs circulating on the refugee crisis. This is a region uh, one can imagine um, on the front lines of a war, but it is not war torn, or is it? It is a region which produces terrorists, but is not in terror, or is it? Or can Branko Milanovic's uh, global inequality data provide apprehension of this? Uh, uh, of this question. Branko Milanovic was the, the World Bank economist that collected all its massive global inequality data for the 2012 massive report on uh, global inequality. And he suggests his data uh, has uh, uh, um, 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 ha uh, had this implication of suggesting that the inequality between the colonized world and the Euro European metropoles a uh, hundred years ago under colonial rule was less than it is today between those same decolonized nation states and the European counterparts. So is then the only way out of poverty if you are born in Pakistan, um, and this is what Branko Milanovic suggests, if you have courage and ingenuity, the only way out then, migration. Pakistani then becomes a kind of limit to the humanitarian response itself, a way of segment segmenting the humanitarian response itself. But if you take a longer look at the stats, uh, they are uh, Pakistanis, that is, are one of the nation groups that have been consistently since at least the 1980s, and I'm meant to use tech to highlight every time Pakistani appears, but it's in the top 10 to 15, and interestingly, Indian included, have been consistently amongst the, the, the largest numbers of people seeking asylum um, 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 uh, in the world. And now, if you think about, about Pakistani, Pakistanis or Indians, um, as since at least the 1980s being the cons uh, consistently the top asylum seekers, um, in the Pakistani context at least, this longer history has created actually a word in Urdu, the language spoken in the region itself. The word in Urdu is donkey, and that was one of my words that I submitted. Uh, for this presentation. The word in Urdu is donkey. It's a made-up word. It's an entirely coined word to capture this historical and ongoing experience. And it means literally an illegal border crossing. And at the same time, it also means a wager between life and death. The, 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 to give you a more accurate, zindagi or moth ka jua, literally uh, a life and death gamble. Um, so the word donkey is both crossing and gambling with your life. Um, in the 1990s, 
Mazhar Zaidi, who was a journalist with the BBC Urdu service, was sent to Lesbos to cover a story when bodies identified as Pakistani washed up from the sea. It led him and his wife to make a film uh, called Zinda Bhag, uh, Run for Your Life, there is Zinda Bhag, which is about three friends that take the donkey in turn. You see the word donkey uh, in its full meaning when you watch the film. They take the donkey in turn over the dead bodies of their very own friends. The couple wrote the script for this film, but when using non-professional actors from a low-income neighborhood in Lahore, they found that the actors were playing a version of their very own stories. It is perhaps here that hunger and donkey come together. Hunger in the first photograph, donkey in the second. Deprivation and des desperation. Abandonment and deportability or deportation that require taking analysis of the crisis elsewhere as well. And which we are, despite the extraordinary proliferation of photographs of the refugee crisis, we are being arguably trained not to see. Okay. Uh, so thank you very much for the invitation and thanks to Bonnie, Lynn, Amanda, Ariella, and Gabrielle. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Last time I was at Brown, I was um, a freshman in high school, 14-year-old girl from Queens, New York. So um, it's kind of cool to be here. Um, and I'm far away from home now that I, I am living in um, Santa Barbara. And I'm reminded of how, just how much of an East Coast girl I am. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, thank you very much for the invitation. So um, I, I understood the prompt uh, to be what other ways of thinking um, might help us understand and illuminate the discourse of refugee crisis. And so I've taken that question as a point of departure for my presentation. Um, I'm thinking very much, as you can see um, here through this image, of how we understand crisis, historical erasure, and as I think Bashara Jumani spoke of, the displacement of people. I center the work of the black radical geographer that most people have never heard of, Clyde Woods, um, whose position I um, sadly took over when he died. Um, his insights and activism in my use of his concept called blues epistemology. I remember assigning one of his pieces, blues epistemology, when I was a TA at MIT. And I was very unsure about what the, um, I come from the urban planning and urban study school there, how the MA students would take it. And in fact, they loved it. Um, and so I, I hope you will come to admire his, his, um, his approach. As his work attests, this phrase doesn't rest on facile re recuperation of race and space, but rather is defined through a really comprehensive political contextualization of long-standing black struggle that provides us with an alternative epistemological politic, what he calls a blues epistemology or a blues politic, and perhaps even a different future. For Clyde Woods, the blues uncovers black political activism and geographic struggles, and it uncovers a practice of making not just music, but all kinds of art, along with the lyrical content of those efforts that together swirl and, and, uh, and contextualize old slave labor plantation production as one of the most monumental burdens ever placed upon any community and nation state. Blues, art, and literature in the black arts movement of the 1960s, which this is a, a principal example of, emerged as a construction of a vision of resistance, of a non-oppressive society, and potentially a new society being born. The conceptual anchors of this idea, blues ontology, posit that the practice of making blues, black-specific multimedia art that extends outward to foster multi-ethnic encounter is an indigenous interactive visionary act that provides the activist with strategies for overcoming the tragedy of daily life as urgent and meaningful. He thought that this 
was what amounted to a different kind of philosophical arsenal. Within the context of global anti-black herbicide and genocide, iconized by Haiti, the Ninth Ward, the ongoing desertification of African regions, the recent Flint, environmental racism, and more, this vision is so urgent to be shared and fostered. For the future that would suggest as possible demands that we actually discuss what would black people have, what do black people have to do with the idea of refugee and crisis? So this image here is called Harriet and the Promised Land, number 10, through forests, through rivers, up mountains. Jacob Lawrence, um, this is the artist, uh, Jacob Lawrence, he, he is a well-known African-American artist who captured black life in the United States from slavery and reconstruction to migration across the West, Midwest, and Northern cities. For me, uh, the, the importance of this image is um, that the black body, as understood here, melding into the environment, has always been a symbol of resistance and crisis simultaneously and historically. Note the method the artist uses here to depict human environment movement and determined survival. At first glance, it may be difficult to disaggregate the difference between the human body and the spaces that the human body is reliant on. This was Jacob Lawrence's attempt at trying to situate the relationship between race and space. This is what I, I posit um, one of the first sort of key moments in the black arts movement of how we can understand a blues epistemology. A perfect example of um, migration and movement and what would become refugees. I want to read to you a short uh, quote that Condoleezza Rice recently um, said uh, that is um, repeated from a paper that Nikhil Singh recently gave. Um, where he was talking about his paper, Beyond Empire and Jim Crow, where he's trying to make the relationship between uh, race and um, Cold War uh, foreign policy. Uh, and I quote Condoleezza Rice, across the empire of Jim Crow, from Upper Dixie to the Lower Delta, the descendants of slaves shamed our nation with the power of righteousness and redeemed America at last from its original sin of slavery. By resolving the contradiction at the heart of our democracy, America finally found its voice as a true champion of democracy beyond its shores. Condoleezza here is performing as a governmental representative. She's using her own blackness and situatedness and embodiedness to illuminate how black Americans are both a kind of Achilles heel to the idea of America as a beacon of democ democratic freedom while at the same time she recuperates and uses a narrative morality through Amer African American history towards foreign policy legitimacy and towards framing an ongoing American exceptionalism. In other words, she's using black history and black bodies to make the case for foreign policy abroad. This is what scholars such as Mary Duziak and Nicole, Nikhil Singh, who I referred to recently, refer to as, quote, Cold War civil rights. Um, this, this conceptualization presents, I think, another aspect of a manipulative blues epistemology, one perhaps that Clyde Woods was not thinking about when he initially conceptualized it. But when I think of what Condoleezza is trying to do and recuperate and exploit through the back black experience, um, I do see it as a sort of sacrificial ideology, sort of using the experience of blackness toward uh, making the case for American exceptionalism abroad. In other words, exploit blacks and their history and marry that to the problem of global disorder, a different kind of fear management, thinking about the administration of fear globally through the history of the black body in the United States. Indeed, Nikhil Singh and others identify the Cold War era as bringing landmark gains in civil rights at the price of stunting black critique of foreign policy with the co-constitutive reaction as anti-intellectual black blindness about the relationship between the black experience and the idea of the refugee and or migrant. I remind you that in a few weeks is the anniversary of Martin Luther, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s assassination, and at the time, he was at an all 
time low approval rating, both in the black community and in the broader white community. And the reason why was he was beginning to become very radicalized about his uh, perception of uh, uh, US involvement in, in Vietnam and the Vietnam War. In addition, he was um, um, on the eve of striking out with what he called the Poor People's March. Um, so there really is a, re a relationship, a somewhat marginalized and perhaps even silenced relationship between the U.S. black experience and um, external colonization and, and how black scholars and intellectuals have often tried to recuperate this relationship often to their detriment. Oh, I'm not there yet, sorry. Uh, an example, in 1956, President Eisenhower and the State Department funded black and white jazz musicians on tours of Africa, Europe, and the Middle East as part of an effort to project images of black social advancement and interracial collaboration, thereby countering, if not negating, Soviet propaganda of America as a racist empire. But these delegations, symbols of a triumphant American democracy, took flight when the US was still a Jim Crow nation. In fact, these tours foregrounded the unprecedented significance of black culture during the early Cold War, a period coinciding with, of course, the civil rights movement, the global anti-colonial struggle. So together, this circular relationship provides the basis for what some people think of as the shape of African-American global politics, with the black body again symbolizing resistance and crisis simultaneously and historically across geopolitical domains. Uh, can you see this image all the way? How do I make this, uh, oh, yeah. oh there, okay. I don't know if you can get it all. I'm so sorry, I'm gonna have to scroll up and down. It says, how to tell your friends from the Japs. Time, December 22nd, 1941. Um, and, and it says, I'm just going to read it because I don't, I don't think you can see. Japanese, except for wrestlers, are seldom fat. They often dry up and grow lean as they age. The Chinese often put on weight, particularly if they are prosperous. Chinese, not as hairy as Japanese, seldom grow an impressive mustache. Most Chinese avoid horn-rimmed spectacles. Japanese walk stiffly, erect, hard-heeled. Chinese, more relaxed, have an easy gait, sometimes shuffle. This is, uh, these are um, examples that I've chosen to illustrate uh, racialized modernity and this idea of the analytics of white mythology that I think serve to silence this relationship between race and global colonial uh, order. Here's another one. This man is your friend. This one here. The Chinese man and the fighting Filipinos. They will always fight for freedom. So this was an attempt um, sort of like the Republican National Convention to reel back in the cat that got out of the box, um, whereas you know uh, racialized citizenship had been allowed, but then we were now at this point where we had to uh, uh, um, recuperate some lines of access to certain others, the Chinese and the Filipinos. And here in particular um, is a great image. Uh, I'm not sure how much you can see. It says, the rising tide of color, the threat against white world supremacy. And then here on the bottom right, on the bottom left is an image. Um, I think it says Hindu labor. And at the top it says undesirable citizens. So these, these reflections of racialized modernity in the United States serve to show us that we've always had refugees, of course, in the United States, and we continue to have examples of these crises, which goes to the question of exactly why crises and why now? Why do we continue to use this idea of crises as if it wasn't an ongoing internal set of issues and processes, as, as I think one of the other speakers had said? I see that um, here. I, I will come back to that other image. This image um, came from Viewpoint Magazine recently uh, from an, an article that was titled When War Comes Home by Jared Loggins, and I'll read an excerpt. 
My father never forgot Vietnam, nor was he ever able to come to terms with the taking and theft of life of those which his homeland had deemed enemies. And if you ask me, one must not simply come to terms with violence as a matter of reckoning with its destructive capacities, for at the root of the matter, one has to think more fundamentally about its very necessity. And even more, one has to think about the paradox of exacting violence for a nation in which he himself had long been disposable. Here, I'll go back to here. This image here, um, War Aims. This was in um, Harrington's newspaper. Um, I mean, Harrington's cartoon and the People's Voice newspaper capturing both the era's morbid ambiance and the uncompromising tenor of black demands. War aims, freedom not only for the people of ravished Europe, but also for the millions of oppressed colored people of Africa, signed by the Negro youths who shall soon die on foreign battlefields. And this is an image that I recently showed in uh, my Urban Dilemma course um, of the other here and the marginalization of the other here. And this conflict about whose space and who belongs. I'm sorry, can you see that? Yeah? Okay. So it says, according to the FBI, anti-Islamic incidents were the second least reported hate crimes prior to 9-11, but following, they became the second highest among religion bias incidents, a growth of 1,600%. And so I, I'm, I'm gonna leave you with, I think this is my, own, yes, this is my last image here. This idea of, now what, so what do we do? I've, pre, I've presented this idea um, that blackness um, challenges the idea of white modernity. And the history of blackness in the United States challenges the idea of white modernity. And also that the black experience in the United States is, is very closely aligned with the global experience of Christ, of so-called crisis and refugee um, experience. So now here in the United States, we have this mix of all kinds of people, those born here, those, those not, those having different kinds of statuses, different kinds of legitimacies in the United States, who are coming together to protest what they believe is wrongful action in this country, their adopted spaces. Um, I look at this image, I interpret this image for you as an example of fear as public power. And you know, fear, of course, you see the blood and you see the yelling and you see the pain and you see um, the disproportionate use and presence of violent actors. But I also see um, fear as a possible language of protest. So, so the recognition of fear, the open, the willingness to, to grapple with fear, the willingness to walk into fear as an opportunity. Thank you. Thanks for the invitation, first of all, and I'm going to keep it quite short. I only drew up a couple of remarks also today during the conference, and um, in addition to that, I will talk a little bit about the projects that I'm currently involved in. Um, while we all speak about Greece with its central role in the economic crisis of the world and its major role as a channel of the refugee migration into Central Europe, we often forget to speak Greek. Um, because the because the word, word crisis actually goes back to this Greek word, krinein, um, which is the same etymological root of critique. So um, I think we should come up to also to wrap up today maybe with a crisis of critique. Why, what are we doing here and why are we so helpless? So maybe to circle back to the very first presentation we heard today. Am I? Can you understand me? Yeah. Okay. Um, the first presentation that we heard today, we have seen that there are strikes, there are performative acts of critique and of protest, um, but what you also see in refugee camps all over the world are riots. There are people collapsing from exhaustion, from heat, from cold, there are mass fights between different refugee groups or security guards, very often shady private companies. 
out of pure desperation because there is no shower or just one for 200 people and people have been waiting for weeks to be processed by bureaucracy. There is sexual harassment and abuse. <laughs> there are the immediate answers. These are immediate answers to the question, what is the refugee crisis? This, it's dirt and violence. And this um, actually is not happening only in Calais um, or in Idomeni, but this is happening in Berlin, two, two minutes by foot from where I live in the nicely gentrified district of Berlin-Kreuzberg. The refugee crisis, however, is also a crisis of data because migration is always about and has always been about administration, about bureaucracy, about infrastructure, networks, resources and technology. Last but not least in the foremost and as a cause of drone warfare. I found this very nice picture which is quite tiny but it's a complete assessment of the current state of the US drone fleet. Drone warfare and digital warfare, a new form of war that has just experienced a few weeks ago its first official declaration of war while still lacking any kind of international convention. So in the alphabet of war, the ABC of atomic, biological and chemical warfare is defined, whereas the subsequent D for digital is not, or at least not yet which maybe also can be understood in this, what we heard about, for, uh, about maritime law, you know, and about the way that maritime law took a long time to be defined. The internet uh, and the realm of data is just as undefined right now as maybe maritime law was two, three hundred years ago. The current situation reflects on the migration of power between governments and states, but also historically shifting to new topographies of power. Um, with refugees, what's migrating is not only bodies, but also data. Um, bodies that are, uh, according to data, both over and underdetermined. In terms of infrastructures, what is maybe most important is not only the internet itself and mobile networks and whatever, but um, what I've shown in the exhibition downstairs is electricity. So while it's important to be close to a place uh, like Bashara has uh, demonstrated where the cell phone reception is good, what you can experience at every train station in Germany when the refugees arrive is the first thing they do is they will crowd around a power outlet and they will try to find someone who has um, a power strip. Um, so that generates a whole new form of um, power and um, about conversion also when you think about standardization of technology when it comes to um, the mobile phone chargers they bring with them, the mobile ch phone chargers that they actually need when they arrive in a different country, even on a different continent maybe. And so these kinds of conversions also of course draw up different kinds of conversations. So um, you can see the situation of people crowding around a power outlet as a form of, a new form of campfire situation if you want. So these streams of migration meet alternating and direct currents. And you could say that before the cultural adaptation um, comes the, the adapter, actually, the technical adapter, um, and the bureaucratic and the political adapter. So media have to rest, and also media have to recharge, and media also map. Um, yeah, this is the title of my piece downstairs. This is kind of small right now. But just as an interesting addition to that, um, it's not very common knowledge here in the West, is that the Chinese internet giant Baidu, which is like Google just for China, has been mapping the biggest migration in, that, that's happening annually, which is the Spring Festival migration of, China, of the Chinese population, um, for years through smartphone data. And we can rest assured that the intelligence services um, of the big nations are doing the same with the refugees right now taking into account all kinds of paranoid and sometimes justified scenarios, of course, of ISIS operatives hiding in the, you know, streams of refugees. So, there's another one. Um, as a reaction to what happened um, in Germany, in the, especially in the last year, um, to the refugee crisis, um, what we came up with is a very practical project. Um, it started actually with just coordinating donations, 
through a Facebook page. Um, and that grew quickly into a community of uh, over 3,000 people, and I mean within a day. Um, and a network of 150 drivers and several locations where you could uh, pick up clothes and donate clothes or drive them somewhere, whatever. And um, then we came up with a project called the Refugee Phrasebook. Um, I can show it to you in its very initial form. It's really just a Google Sheet, which of course is incredibly messy when you take into account that within three days we were up to 30 languages, now we have 44, and uh, over a thousand different phrases for both basic orientation, medical, um, special vocabulary, and juridical questions. Um, it was quite amazing to see how big the response was um, internationally to see how many people would just by themselves start, and I mean many, most of them actually anonymously, start to work on these Google Sheets, overload them entirely, but also in, in a very nice way with little or no guidance actually, they would maintain themselves. So if there was um, an error, it would be corrected within minutes, basically. Um, which then resulted in um, the first copies of the Refugee Facebook being printed in a copy shop at a train station in Vienna just three days basically after the start of the project while thousands of refugees were arriving in Vienna um, every day. Um, it's very easy to start, pro start projects like this. It's very hard, however, to sustain them um, because you have a lot of response in the first month or two or three, but um, then it becomes very hard. We got a lot of support, also uh, donations uh, for printing um, in, the, in the very few months. So basically, but, um, I kind of forgot to tell you what the Refugee Facebook actually is. Refugee Facebook is, as I said, a collection of phrases. It's entirely open data, so everyone can use it and modify it, and everyone can turn it into printable versions, however they wish to do that. We offer several ways of doing that um, through our website, um, which works with Wikibooks, where you can create custom print versions. Um, so this is our website. And we have a couple of different print versions already for different regions also, because of course not every region needs 44 different languages. Um, so usually it's about six or seven different languages and a certain selection of phrases that is being used. Um, lots of them were, uh, and, and the question of course is how do you sustain it, but also how do you keep it open and, and adaptable? Um, and how do you deal with the problems that all the volunteer structures always inevitably run into because we're not professionals, you know? And that's something I think, um, we spoke about it briefly last night at dinner, also is how and how does policy and how does activism interact um, at the current, in the current moment? Um, I think that's a very, very tough question um, to see where policy and infrastructures and bureaucracies are failing, which they clearly are, um, in Germany at least, and I know that it's the same along the Balkan route in many places and how volunteers are stepping in and how this could potentially, I mean, there's such a great potential for a change in the way that certain problems are being approached. One could be, uh, that would I, I would like to suggest, could be what I would like to call infrastructural or administrative misappropriation. I made very good experience with uh, especially universities stepping in in a very non-bureaucratic way to help, for example, us as the Refugee Facebook project with using their printers for free, um, but also offering to, um, in a very unbureaucratic way, invite refugees into the university um, to facilitate access to education and um, all these kinds of things. I want to show you, just, I'm just going to throw scrolled through some pictures. This is at the Willem de Koning Academy in the Netherlands, um, who also adapted the Refugee Facebook, made their own version, and did a printing shop. So this is something which is very, I think, it's, it's very adaptable, especially for universities, to do something like this. Um, this is a very crazy guy from Croatia, 
we decided um, to print 100,000 copies. So including the copies he made, um, we're almost at 150,000 printed and distributed copies at the moment. Um, however, we are out of money and um, at the moment we cannot print any books except, expect, ex, except if you donate or um, if you go to our website you can also see that we have been nominated for the Advocate Europe Award and if you vote for us we might get, if we're very lucky, 5,000 euros which would print some books. So go vote for us. Um, these are the first ones in Vienna at the train station. You can see they always look very different and um, are stored in different places all over. This is in Idomeni. Um, also, the data has been incorporated into several apps, one of which has just come out today, actually. It's a new Android and um, iOS app that uh, is available free, for free, of course, um, which incorporate the data. Another project that I would like to very briefly introduce is oh, is a project that um, will open tomorrow in Vienna. It's called Green Light and it's a collaboration between an art foundation called TBA21 and uh, the Danish uh, artist Olaf Eliasson, which I helped to um, conceptualize. And the TBA21, which is a private foundation, um, has however for the next three months completely devoted their entire museum space uh, which is located in a park in Vienna's second district, which in itself represents the role of migration in Austria's history, into a space of encounter. So a group of roughly 40 refugees, mostly unaccompanied minors from Syria and Afghanistan, as well as everyone else, is invited to use the space. Um, these people are also, as you know, in a sort of limbo. They are not allowed um, to, to do any kind of education and they're not allowed to work. So. Um, they are pretty much caught in the middle of everything and cannot do anything. So this is what the, pro what the project addresses. And um, Eliasson has designed a lamp, which you can see here on the table, which is built from recycled and sustainable materials, wooden seat 3D printed polymers, um, which are constructed and assembled in the space as a workshop and sold with 100% uh, of the proceeds being donated back to aid or organizations. Um, during the three months of the project, the space also hosts uh, daily German glass classes, collective cooking and eating, soccer and many other forms of informal encounter. So basically it's a nice place to hang out also. And there are almost weekly workshops by architects, artists and theorists. Um, you can see the 3D printers in the background. This was just last week when they were sort of um, installing the workshop and trying it out, so the opening is tomorrow, and if you end up in Vienna, you should definitely go and see it. Um, and this is what it looks like in the end. Um, I want to end by going back to the crisis, back to critique, but uh, to a critique of how we here deal with it, because um, critique, krinein, means to distinguish, to discriminate, but also to make a difference. The refugee crisis is not an academic problem, but it's a problem for academics. And um, I think we should think about the question how we can use the humanities for humanitarian aid. Thank you. So um, I think we can have questions and discussions, sorry, am I totally in your way? For like about a half an hour. Um, so, questions, comments? Any time for things to percolate? So, uh, <clears throat> thank you. Uh, this is a, a, a question to Alessandro. Um, I was uh, interested, very, very interested by the project and the way that you uh, conceptualize the refugee cities, and I'm wondering how applicable it is to um, refugee camps in other places in the world as well. And particularly, I was reminded of uh, comments that uh, Alexander Alenikov, who has um, recently ended his role as the United Nations High 
Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees, gave, has, has been giving for a long time now, about refugee camps, uh, especially in Africa, especially in Kenya, places like Dabab, uh, that have not been integrated into the domestic economies for a very, very long periods of time. And the UNHCR uh, policy now, seemingly an inno presented as, as an innovative policy, is to um, create incentives for more jobs uh, locally, to cut back on aid, and, the, and all of this is kind of um, presented under the title of refugee, refugee camps are, become, are becoming cities. Um, but with, however, with no, with, without addressing the question of ultimate status and of, of citizenship, because that's something that is much more politically sensitive. So I'm, I'm wondering if your experience in, in the Palestinian context can inform the, the, the desirability of such policies um, with specifically the concern being that they might create a kind of, you know, perpetual class of people who are, you know, working but do not have citizenship, which may indeed, you know, already be the case. So the moral dilemma becomes kind of uh, difficult. Um. Maybe I will start from going backwards to the last point that you finished, which is also maybe, I'm not also entirely sure if there is now, um, these days, a complete distinction between uh, these two groups, the citizens and the refugees. Um, I think we are confronted um, with massive wave of denationalizations. I mean, there are more and more citizens that uh, lost uh, some of the the rights, uh, and also it, I I think would be interesting to uh, maybe expand the idea of a refugee condition, which would actually imply many people, many I think I think also myself, and you know, many other people that I know that who are not technically refugees, but at the same time you are not a citizen in the country where you live, uh, at least in the old the very old traditional way in which you are. Uh, and I guess this also is a bit the crack that is, um, you know, we're trying to inhabit. In which somehow um, the solution cannot be the, um, the way of um, the illusions to normalize refugees, you know, to ground them citizenship in a moment in which actually you have um, at the same time the erosion of uh, rights. So in that sense, the camp opened uh, that what I also call it, which is a very compromised space, uh, very far from you know, uh, idealizing it, but at the same time is where certain dynamics are completely clear, you know, because for some people they still live under the illusion they are citizens, but when things get um, messy, I, they discover they are not anywhere, and this usually happens among borders or if there are wars or, you know, there are different moments. So the first thing I would very much try to you know, include in these discussions a larger understanding of, uh, of this transformation that is happening, you know, which is not just them, the refugees, but I guess it's a, it's a condition, it's a general condition that, um, that unlikely would go back into these boxes of nation states. So the question is, what comes after that? You know? and, and that is where I see we can learn from refugee camps, um, and again, without idealizing them, without proposing, I'm not here proposing this as a, uh, as a model, you know, of uh, urban growth or you know, social uh, connections. Um, but I also believe, for example, if one is interested to understand how a community could live beyond an idea of uh, private and public spaces, this is a place where you can look at and exist. It's, uh, it's a place in which there is a different sense of collectivity and communality that you don't have, for example, in, uh, uh, in cities in which still we are you know, very much living in these uh, private, public uh, conditions. Um, therefore, I think strategically I would um, um, I describe you know, Palestinian refugee camps because they are the oldest, have a you know, certain kind of history, but I think this can be extended to uh, other camps, you know, the, the camps that today uh, you have in Jordan, 
where there are hundreds of people, it would be unlikely that they will just disappear in a second. So I think the question would be uh, how they can be transformed, how people can move among you know, these spaces. Also to remove camp from just being a humanitarian space, but actually be also a space in which certain claims can be, can be made, certain social organization can be uh, restructured. And on this also, and may I finish that, is also to look at um, most of non-Western European cities. They um, work much closer to, uh, they're more similar to refugee camps than very formalized uh, cities. Um, therefore, if you start to include um, a lot of informal settlements, you know, that's also is a very important debate that, for example, is happening, especially in, in South America, if this Islam should be normalized, should be improved, and how that is happening. In this, I think there is a lot of things that I think we can learn from refugees, how they manage somehow to try to live a life of dignity, but at the same time remaining that sort of political subject that in a way are not um, just, you know, uh, buying into the idea of uh, just being a citizen. I mean, when I say this, I know how painful it is, you know, when you are not, but I also believe that it's an illusion to think that today the solution is uh, normalization of citizenship, when we actually live in a completely already different context. Um, yeah, I... Oh, and then, yeah, our body, and then, sorry. I'll be brief. I don't know if the answers will be brief, but my question is really for Paul and for Mia. And I was thinking about your work together, about the idea of a blues epistemology. It made me wonder about the possibility of a refugee epistemology for someone who's working on keywords for refugees and, uh, and someone working on key images, in a way. Uh, for, I don't know, do you want it, would you want to use the term domestic refugees? I don't know. When I think of how Tocqueville talks about the three races in America, um, he basically says they're here, but they don't belong here in some way. Um, so maybe that would be okay for you. But, um, but is there, could there be, once we're pluralizing epistemology in this kind of way and thinking about something like blues epistemology, which I really liked, um, I'm just wondering whether the creation of a lexicon doesn't itself postulate some kind of epistemology and whether something like a refugee epistemology is what it postulates or not. So, for the two of you. Uh, I, would, I would just say that though, though I, um, I'm, I'm very, I find the blues epistemology concept very generative, I still myself find it uh, limiting, quite limiting in some ways. Um, but I, I love it and I'm working with it right now. Um, uh, so it, in a sense, the idea, so going back to your, your, your use of the word refugee, so obviously it's a very important term and it helps us uh, express ideas and it helps us communicate with each other. Obviously it also silences and creates a boundary around what is and what is not whatever it is that we conceptualize as refugee. So um, it feels like the idea of uh, a lexicon requires um, some sort of collaborative, solidarity-based, you know, community exploration. It, it seems like it's something that, you know, absolutely must occur, you know, in community with those who have a vested interest in, in that exploration. And then just going back to um, your question and, and the comment here from um, um, Alessandro, I was thinking about, again, um, I'm American, uh, so I, perhaps my comments are a bit US-centric, but I'm thinking very much about the colonias in the United States and about um, all of the um, unincorporated, informal black and brown towns in the United States with, uh, you know, they're not, they're not categorized as towns. They're unincorporated, they're, uh, they're informal, there's no running water. Uh, the colonias, which are the, uh, along the Mexico-U.S. border, again, no sanitation, no water. You know, so it, it, you know, there's quite a um, possible generativity here in the United States for, uh, from which to theorize um, who is a refugee and under what conditions and through what mechanisms does one become um, connected to this status. Um, so. um, 
I would also come back to what Alessandro said about sort of the urban state or the, the spatial state of uh, refugees and migration. I think this is, of course, also true uh, epistemolo epistemolo epistemologically. Um, uh, since we've seen today, I mean, lots of you, lots of presentations have been very historical and uh, have shown that it has, it's, it, this has always been going on, uh, that we call it a crisis now implies somehow or is, might, might even be misleading since it uh, makes you feel that it's just happening now and it's, it hasn't happened before, but it's a process and of course um, there uh, not only has to be, but there is already a, a, a refugee epistemology if you want. And of course, I mean, in the creation of the Refugee Facebook, it has been incredibly interesting to see how this language built itself and how, um, like, of course, there are some things that are quite universal when it comes to creating um, a medical Facebook. We had a team of doctors, volunteer doctors, and there are just some things um, that are uh, that every doctor internationally will need to know or, you know, questions that need to be asked. Um, however, how they are asked can differ widely, you know, and uh, are, are very much subject to cultural sensitivities when it comes to anything sexual, for example. Um, so this is one example, but also, I mean, we were astounded to see what kind of questions and phrases would show up in these phrase books because this was language creating itself um, and you could watch it. It was just happening like by the minute, you know. So there, there is uh, a lot of... Um, material in there for analysis and uh, but I think however you know um, there is more to be done actually than to be analyzed. I just add um, about this idea of lexicon um, Neil Brenner who's an, an urban scholar and, and um, uh, anyway uh, has written a lot about actually existing neoliberalisms and within one of his key papers, he talks about ongoing crises situations. And he, he sort of asks us to rethink the idea of neoliberalism versus um, neoliberal projects. And so I wonder if we extrapolate neoliberal projects and crisis projects rather than crisis, you know, in a sort of using his, um, you know his his conceptual model in that in that one paper I'm thinking of. He's thinking that the idea of this you know uh, such a strong structure, neoliberalism as a never-ending structure, is 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 not entirely helpful to us. So the idea of ne neoliberal projects and and what that how that might help us with the lexicon around refugee projects or processes. Um, so my question is for Mia and Paul. Uh, for Mia, there's, there was at some point an extraordinary exchange in the New York Times around resettling um, Syrian refugees in Detroit. And that triggered an immense conversation in Detroit around this question. And it was a deeply racialized conversation yes. where the Syrian was white. Mm -hmm. The Syrian was prosperous, yes. industrious, yes. versus the emptied out, va vacant, in this discourse space that is Detroit that the Syrian can then rebuild. So my question in that sense is how, do, how does the whiteness, how does the racialization of the Syrian as white versus other kinds of refugees factor into kind of the kind of form you're taking around racialized modernity? And also the question of the other sin of America, which is indigenous genocide. Yes, yes. And how is a refugee ever a settler um, in, in so far as what it means to be indigenous in the United States versus not? Um, to Paul, my question was around, you know, one of the things that I've been currently fascinated by is the cheese factory in Lesbos, where a group of Greeks have come together and organized this cheese factory where, that is run by refugees. But what was interesting in, in talking to um, the organizers of this is that you, so you, in the end you talked about the kind of fugitive possibilities in the way in which you can recirculate resources. And one of the things they talked about, and this is a broader conversation, I only know Arabic, so I, I, I read conversations amongst Syrians and Palestinians around this question, is how do we not alienate our host populations? And this is a historical question, because Palestinians have a very, at points in their history, 
had huge debates around the mistakes they made in their liberation movement because they alienated the local population. This is very true in, Syria, in Jordan in particular. So in, 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 in Greece, these cheese factories, what they've done is the, there is so much donations, material resources being dumped on the island that some of them don't even make sense for the refugees. Yeah, Multivitamins, like random stuff that could be, that are now by s fugitively, criminally smuggling back into a Greece in crisis. There's another crisis in Greece, right? So that this kind of circulation of goods amongst a kind of undercommon, right? Or I, I call them undercommon, but like amongst those, you know, by, at, you know, the precarious, um, is a kind of interesting process because it's, there's an element of fear involved in this. You see this, for example, in Cologne when women after the sexual predator kind of thing happened, were distributing flowers in the square in order to say, no, 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 we're good. Our men may be messing around. Never to challenge the actual validity of the claim, but to kind of bring in this respectability. We are respectable refugees, mm -hmm. hear us. So I just, I, I'm curious as to kind of how you encounter this idea, this distribution of goods and this, these practices in your own organizing. Yeah, I mean, this has proven to be difficult at first because I, uh, I mean, what happened in Germany was uh, good things and bad things, you know? I mean, still now, um, almost every week there is news of some refugee shelter often being burned down before people can even move in because that's what a f you know, community in Lower Saxony decides to do. Um, or a bus being you know, attacked by an angry mob, um, which is then spun by the press as to say that the bus was full of refugees attacking the uh, peaceful population of the small community, which is funny considering there were like 14 year old boys in there. Um, so this has been going on all the time and political movements are forming and are getting stronger and stronger in Germany that, that are really very disconcerting. Um, but at the same time there's also been a, a big shift in the way that um, the German population has engaged in every kind of volunteer activity. And of course because uh, as I said before also that we're not professionals um, they were often helping in wrong ways and this is what I find interesting to see how this form of organizational knowledge um, has started very quickly and born out of urgency to, to develop and to grow. You know, at first there, there were donations in, in, in Berlin in my personal circle where suddenly we had, I don't know, 600 pairs of pants but uh, no shoes or whatever. And so, people were using different kinds of techniques and technologies uh, um, to come up with solutions for that. And um, about the alienation, um, I also know people who work on COS, a friend of mine runs all the um, aid there, um, and she's, she's speaking about the same thing, but I think, I mean, to a certain extent, this is a very alienating process for everyone. People are de being displaced, so it's not them who are alienating. Um, they are alienated, you know? I, I, I did a workshop in Switzerland with art students about the way that they could maybe uh, use their resources and their institutions to come up with it. And they were, uh, and we're talking about Switzerland, of course, you know, this is a very tiny, very closed country. But they were talking about being scared of refugees and I said, don't you think they're more scared of you, actually? I mean, they're the minority. They're the ones um, that just had a really, really long and troublesome journey and who have to face um, basically being disembodied uh, as, as, a, as an individual of law, as an individual um, of education, of ec economy. Um, so I think, I mean, it's, yeah. Does this somehow answer your question? I could go on, but... Um, I would say that, thank you for your question, I would say that um, Syrians, the difficulty is that there already are so many Syrian Americans in the United States, and in as much as Syrian Americans have benefited from their proximity to whiteness, it then creates a social distance between those who experience anti-blackness, whether or not they're black. And so the space of Detroit is very interesting 
um, I, I would say that a Syrian, you know, experience is sort of a precarious whiteness, uh, as very similar to um, the American Jew, which is also a precarious whiteness. Um, as a, as, a si as a a side note, um, uh, uh, recently my uh, I have a um, a crazy racist neighbor who uh, was screaming, you know, you effing um, nigger bitch, go back to Africa to me, and then saying you and your Jew nigger kids to screaming for 20, we called the sheriff, we called the, and it, it's very fascinating. So, so you know, there's a, there's a precarious whiteness. <laughs> um, and, but many Syrian Americans don't necessarily, um, many Syrian Americans um, are socialized as white, despite a precarious whiteness. So what that means is there are already embedded dynamics. So it's very difficult. I would just uh, end the, the, the statement with um, the way that I teach um, uh, uh, courses on race um, to undergraduate students who uh, have some limited ideas about it is that I don't talk about it as it being about white, being white or being black or being Afro-Asian as I am, it is, it's a set of relationships predicated on historical white supremacy. So it's almost like a, it's a triangle and the entire triangle is race, the system of race. And so like if I were to whisper in the ear of a Syrian uh, family who is going to relocate to Detroit, I would really want them to understand this triangle and help them decide whether they will move toward what Syri many Syrian Americans uh, identify as, uh, you know, white, whether they will uh, exploit that proximity to whiteness, or will they openly remain in a liminal position and embrace uh, an even more precarious whiteness in solidarity with those who experience anti-blackness. And it's a lot to ask anybody, right? I mean, you're coming from a very difficult situation, and um, you're asking them, and, and please maintain your precarity here. So, but I think it's necessary in the, in the, in the, in the, toward the goal of solidarity. Are refugees as yet? In the sense of, one of the things that I find interesting about the discourse around refugees entering the United States mm -hmm. is this question of this being a settler colony. Yes, well, I right? mean, it, So yes. what is the native when yeah, a refugee enters? So I, just to, to kind of think around yes. race and indigeneity, because I know that that tension remains yes. in the literature and in discourse and in the politics. Yes. Um, and the native disappears and sometimes blackness disappears and, and how that kind of tension can be resolved or dealt with or contended with. I mean, I agree with you. Yeah. I, obviously, I, I agree that, that you know um, the Native American experience is, is is predicated on the papal bull, right? And you know, sort of whiteness and settler history was predicated on the on the papal bull and all of these edicts that then wed uh, married Christianity with whiteness and manifest destiny, et cetera, and so forth. The United States. So, indigenous populations in North America absolutely would would identify new um, British colonials as refugees and as settlers simultaneously. I would think, given from my own studies and my own education. But so I agree. I don't. I don't think you know. I think it's something we twist and churn with some difficulty. Uh, yeah, I have. I'm not sure if it's a question, I'll try. Some people took the liberty to try their question, uh, so I'll go, uh, I'll try. Uh, I have a very uh, concrete question uh, to you, Mia, about, you uh, spoke about blues, I really like the blues epistemology and the way that you worked with it, but you mentioned uh, that the blues is a, a black-specific form of multimedia. If you can say something about the m a multimedia, in relation to this. And then my more vague question is, it came when I heard Bishara and when I heard Alessandro, and it reminded me that when I read your uh, bio, uh, Mazna, you wrote that you are uh, working on uh, the War of 48. And you mentioned, Alessandro, that uh, there is one event, which is the Nakba 48, and 
then you spoke about the refugee camp. And Bishara, you said you uh, emphasized, you said it several times, for an historian this is not new. But what does it mean that this is not new for an historian? And how do I link these 48 uh, Nakba event, etc.? Uh, when I insist on the fact that we have to think about this migration, forced migration, in the 500 years, it is not because it is not new, it is because it's not only because it is not new, it is because on the one hand it is not new, but on the other hand, what we have are structures that not only are not new, but are uh, mummies, that are fossils. And these structures are, for example, uh, uh, War of 48. So I understand you use War of 48, of course, in order not to use many other uh, terms. You s speak about the Nakba because these terms encompasses what we want to, uh, to make, uh, to keep uh, in the discourse. But the Nakba was not an event of 48. The Nakba started in 47, or even er earlier, people would say, and it ended many years after. The expulsion of 750,000 people didn't happen in one day, even not in one year. So uh, what I'm a little bit interested, uh, if you can think about, is this tension between um, processes and on the other hand uh, structures or terms that are like functions like mummies we cannot really uh, think beyond them or we have to struggle in order to think beyond them and one of them would be war for example the term war or war of 48 which is I mean when you say this you already imply that there were two sides and there was war between two sides and when you speak about the Nakba as an event you erase and I don't blame you I don't think that you erase but using the term Nakba 48 is already uh, uh, mummifying the continuous, uh, uh, not expulsion of Palestinians, but the continuous process of keeping Palestinians uh, 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 f outside of the borders of uh, what was their homeland. Uh, and Bishara, if you can say something about, it's not new, but when you say it's not new, it's not because there is an accumulation of events, it's that these accumulation of events are processed through a certain a cluster of terms or through a clusters of uh, coordination that uh, enable them to repeat once and again <laughs> along 500 years at least. I don't know if it's a question or comment, but I would like to hear you about this. Sure. Um, I'm not sure I understand the question, but uh, there is, of course, um, the imperative of linear time that most historians think within that framework, and that assumes there's change, of course, that they try to figure out the causes for change. And so by saying it's not new is not saying that this is just repeating itself, it's just uh, uh, pointing out uh, that the very... Um, production of historical narratives, the very production of ways of seeing, um, often is premised on processes of erasure. So it looks new, it feels new, people think it's a crisis, when in fact they have been discussing the same issue for a very long time. Uh, this is, I think, the racialized part brings that into focus very clearly. And uh, Muslims, as you know, are, have been racialized. They're, 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 they're a race now, they're no longer a religion. Uh, but that is not new either. Uh, but we see it more clearly now. So uh, there is a deeper, perhaps, epistemological issue about process and event, the question of rupture, what is the meaning of rupture. Uh, a lot of the theoretical approaches that I've sort of heard echoes of in uh, today um, really demand uh, rupture to make sense. And the problem for me is that uh, rupture can mean many things and um, I don't see it as a precondition for having an analytical apparatus. So, um, uh, because I think it basically depoliticizes and um, hides power relations and 
constantly reaffirms the European sort of experience. So, um, you know, that, that is a bigger issue that uh, we can discuss now. Settler colonialism, you're right, is a process. 1948 is one data point in that process. So, uh, um, I take your point there. In fact, I insist on it, that this is true. But I would argue that uh, settler colonialism is just one of many manifestations of colonialism. And that itself is one of many manifestations of uh, uh, forms of displacement that have really, um, let's call them the dark side of modernity. We can think of technology, progress, whatever, but I think that displacement has been uh, the constant humming engine. Uh, and uh, we, it, it cannot be seen and it cannot be discussed openly because, because uh, it, it would require a much more radical sort of solution and perspective than just looking at the question of refugee crisis itself um, would do. Oh, look, look, you wanted to say yeah, just a, just a little remark or question. Maybe everybody wants to say their final yeah. sort of comment and statement and then we will close up. Um, I mean, we spoke, or you spoke about the collapse of time and space, of yeah. one kind of, one sort of uh, collapse yeah. of time and space that's happening. But if we speak about being an event, about process and event, um, and about what I mentioned before, about the state of permanent crisis, I think there's, an, there's another collapse going on here. Mm -hmm. You know, that war and th the way that historically we dealt with these things and that we look at them historiographically cannot be applied uh, in the same way today where we have a very different kind of, of war and, uh, and cultural effect of warfare because it's, it's, it's not a war as an event, you know? It's war as a permanent state of distributed warfare. Mm -hmm. So we are within World War III ever since World War II stopped, if you want, you know? So um, I think, yeah, this, it could be fruitful to think about the collapse of, of being an event and to not make this distinction, or at least to see it as some kind of a recursive function. Can I just say something quickly to that? Because one thing that I thought was interesting that connected, I think, all of you is playing with, in a way, and revealing the inadequacy of thinking about a binary between permanence and, and, tempor and temporariness or event and permanence that in some ways even gets literalized in things like Alessandro's your work in, in, in constructing something that is like a temporary tent, but it's not because it's also a built structure, right? So ways of trying, you know, and, and I think in a very different way, like your project, Paul, where the, the kind of temporariness of anything in, in digital media where it can constantly be changed, like you said, like somebody will put something up and 30 seconds later it might ship, but yet you've got kind of a permanent architecture, even a virtual, you know, in a way for that. So it seems in a way, one of the things that I think links all of you is this very interesting sort of reconceptualization of relations of spatiality and temporality to try to get at something that breaks down this division between like structure and process or permanent and temporariness. So just an observation, but, but you guys make your final statement. <laughs> I think I made mine already. I was, um, maybe everyone knows this person already. I was, I just discovered Paul Virilio. Yes. <laughs> so, okay. So I, I was reading him last night and, you know, he's a planner philosopher. That's pretty wild. And he talks about fear as predicated on shrinking time, which kills space little by little, which seems like very much related to what you just said. Um, my, I, I guess closing, I would say, um, oh, multimedia, uh, in terms of blues epistemology. So I was thinking about Jacob Lawrence and his, his you know, clear um, approach to art, right? He's using um, acrylic on canvas, you know, et cetera, oil. Yeah. And, and then I'm thinking about Killer Mike, right, who was, um, was um, rallying for Bernie Sanders. His name is Killer Mike because he kills the mic, you know, when he, when he does, uh, rapping, not, you know, killing or anything, so, um, and, and, but he, he is like the 2016 version of, of black arts, right, because what he does is he translates through lyrical poetry all of the angst and social rage that we saw, um, because the black arts movement was like the friendly artsy sister to the black power movement, right? So, but Killer, and so Killer Mike is doing this like translate, anyway, so 
an, uh, you know, what I mean by multimedia is all of these different um, ways of understanding how to bring um, feeling and, and he, you know, the human experience to somebody else, some approach to close the social dis the distance. The, um, and uh, I just, I, I guess I just wanted to say one last thing for those who, who are here with the Elvis Presley um, earlier today. So um, I did want to say that, you know, the, the, the tradition of the Negro spiritual is so, um, n you know, um, deeply Im embedded in the black experience. But, um, but Elvis using the Negro spiritual to make his point is a perfect example of the sewing lips that we saw later on, right? Because the Negro spiritual, I mean, it's, it's, it's like the height of irony for this very handsome young white man to be singing a Negro spiritual on the, on the show in order to gain, uh, in order to uh, transmit American morality and sort of guilt people into having a better global perspective, which is exactly what Condoleezza Rice did in my reading, which is another, ver I guess he presaged, you know, the Cold War civil rights mantra that Nikhil Singh and, and others. Um, so, so I just wanted to say that I, I noticed that and it kind of tripped me out that, you know, imagine all of the people who suffered, who came up with all of that song and who are, who are essentially metaphorically sown as Elvis is admired for singing the Negro spiritual. Yeah, thank you. I've really enjoyed uh, listening to everyone and their comments and made me think, you know, if we're in a moment of where there's a crisis of the nation state that uh, makes citizenship not the horizon, not the aspiration, then maybe if you think about the sort of sense of refugee crisis being centered in Europe, then refugeeness rather than being uh, um, a marginality becomes uh, the, the aspiration. I mean, that's to become refugee rather than, sort of, you know, in a sea of migrants. If we, if, if we take Bashara's point of thinking about displacement rather than uh, refugeeness versus migrants, uh, becoming refugee, uh, being recognized as refugee because of the way in which the refugee crisis is being narrated out of uh, out of uh, European center um, that is that is an aspiration uh, and if we think of that as an aspiration then what might be its um, ripple effects of thinking about sort of the larger nation state and its inability to mm -hmm. Um, yeah, maybe I go back to um, to the question of Ariella um, that has to do with the, with the use of certain terms and um, certain vocabulary. I think I don't know the way how um, in that there is a kind of um, methodology of political uh, um, strategy, which is trying to um, um, remake certain definitions instead of maybe bringing necessarily new terminology to things. But also I've learned to understand, and especially when you want to be heard, I think it's, it's, it's much uh, interesting politically to, to use certain terms. Because the Nakba, for example, I understand maybe is also different because Nakba didn't end it. I mean, just yesterday they are still, uh, you know, throwing out people from Jerusalem, deporting people, display, I mean, they're never... I don't think that was from 1947 to 1949. Um, so, but I think that is interesting for me because that, I think it's something that can be discussed and that is a kind of political arena in which uh, somehow more people can actually join into, uh, into trying to define it. What I find also interesting in many of the things that maybe we discussed today, but I, f I find very common in many projects, let's say the political concept, our collected dictionary in the, in the campus in camps, you know, this project on, on the world. I think there is, we live in a moment which there is this important redefinition of what we mean about certain things. We work, for example, a lot about returns. 
you know, return what is more sacred, you know, among Palestinian Turkey over there. It's like committing suicide, but it's actually become very interesting, you know, to engage because these are also really political arena in which people can really go and discuss and understand things and transform concepts. They're much more interesting to, you know, in architecture you can build something new or reuse things. I'm interested in reusing things bringing new life to, to old terms instead of, you know, building something nice and new that nobody will understand what is it and have to, you know, I, I, in that sense, I also use that space of ambiguity to actually learn myself, you know, into this and use that as a space of, of, uh, of dialogue. And maybe very final point is, the, um, yeah, I think it's, it's a very good point to, to try to liberate both the idea of uh, permanency and temporality, how we understand them, because in the way we understand temporality only as a kind of, um, as a kind of dimension that is, uh, is linked to the deprivation of, of rights and, and permanency as acquisition of rights. I think that could be also changed very much because I think if the idea to, be, uh, to have certain political rights, maybe in certain cases could be also temporality used uh, as, as, a, as, as a strategy. So it's not necessarily, let's say, as a, as a kind of uh, negative dimension. And this is where I think the condition of refugees and the camp itself um, could be still an arena in which that also political relation is, uh, is changes. It is not anymore necessarily framed into the idea of becoming a citizen into a nation state. Some people still believe that this is the way how to acquire rights. I'm not completely sure about that. I think that from a refugee perspective, we can maybe have a different strategy to claim that this right and this political right. Yeah. Just one second, Chair, did you? Actually, I would. Yeah. Is yeah. that okay? Well, I know course. you guys are tired, but. Yeah. So, yeah, very quickly. <laughs> um, um, the, for intellectuals who consider themselves activists or at least engaged scholars, it's always a constant exercise to figure out rationalizations for why we do what we do. Um, and we can think of many throughout the years, it's a long debate, but I think you're, you're right, Alessandro, we, we are living through a moment in which the number one justification for being an intellectual is that you need to come up with a new analytical vocabulary uh, in order to imagine a different future because the previous politics just is collapsed and, uh, and people everywhere, especially in the arts um, and in, in, in sort of social civic organizations on the local level are coming up always with new ideas, new things, and academics are just beginning to get into that game trying to figure out how we can talk about the world differently so we can imagine that different future. I hope, I hope it works. Um, but uh, the, I think there is a fundamental issue here and that when it comes to questions of permanence or temporality, the most important thing is the rule of property. Property is key. This is really uh, the moment where uh, I think there was a kind of a hint here that uh, in this new world, uh, the nation state and citizenship, which is fundamentally about our rule of property, um, <clears throat> is no longer the horizon. And therefore, the alternative is what? Uh, and it's true that in refugee camps and in many spaces uh, that are under now a kind of weird conglomeration of systems of governance, you, the property is not really owned. You don't know who owns this house or this land. Uh, you live there for 50 years. How do you, what, do you, what, do you, what is it that you have and that you don't have? Uh, there's no real definition of all, all of these things. Now, <clears throat> it's tempting to think of that as a commons, like a, a la Chiapas in Mexico with the Zapatista movement, etc. But I, I, I do think that there is a risk of romanticization. There are big risks because if you really dig deep down into a lot of these uh, places, you realize that people come up with their own rules of property and that there are serious power relations involved in who lives where, how, who builds what, when, regardless of the seeming lack of an actual rule of property. And, and not understanding that is really not taking the experience of these refugees seriously and therefore not taking the vocabulary that they might produce seriously. So let me just say in, in closing that, um, uh, especially in thinking of terminology, I'm glad that you reminded us, Paul, and the, the phrase, what is a refugee crisis, that crisis also derived from the same 
term is critique. So I thank all of the participants for really modeling for us the way that one can begin to critique these very notions and start to think through them differently. So thank you to everybody, to all the participants. I also want to say you are all invited to dinner, which is at the faculty club, um, which is sort of on the other side of campus, but I think a number of people here know where it is. Like, it seems like there's a lot of fabulous graduate students around who know where it is, so maybe you guys can kind of wait for people downstairs and, and walk folks over to the faculty club where there will be some wine and food. And again, there's enough for everybody. So I hope folks can come and join us there and we can continue the conversation or just relax and et cetera. So again, thank you everybody.